The Mummery Book by Adidas Samraj The Parable of the Divine True Love Told by means of self-illuminated illustration of the totality of mind Part 1 The First Room Chapter 1 Raymond Darling was standing in the room, then sitting, until he fell to a whitest death by falling down to all his life. At first, and all the while he stood, his strong right hand above his head was higher than all the stars of natural light, and the whole where all the universe begins and ends was there in his true heart, and he spoke the conscious hum of thunderlight aloud. He felt the natural heat of his body rising up and fusing with his raised right hand, his face and his right hand's fingers, and even all the curves and angles of his body were a standing openness to his own and very love bliss light, divine and highest high, above his head to toe of human shape. And so he stood. Then he sat down, down on the high back chair provided. There he rested both his hands within his lap, and he looked around, he looked at the wallpaper and the shape of the room. There was a slight chill, a duplicate high back chair was there, up close, in front of his knees. He decided to work. He removed both his shoes and he removed his belt. He placed his left shoe on the duplicate chair in front of him. Then he took his right shoe firmly in his right hand and with his left hand he pressed the buckle of his belt against the toe of his left shoe, in front of him on the seat of the duplicate high back chair. He raised his right shoe above his head. For a moment he felt the risen heat of the room brace against the knuckles of his raised right hand, which he held to highest high above his head. Then, with a fierce shout and with terrible weeping, he drove his right shoe down with his right hand, as if to drive the buckle of his belt into the toe of his left shoe. The right shoe in his right hand glanced against the upright back of the duplicate chair, as he had intended from the first, and the hard heel of his right shoe in hand was deflected, hard so that the hard heel of his right shoe in hand struck and penetrated the soft tendon under his exposed left knee. Suddenly he felt a shock of living light from above his head and the light swelled into an explosive wave all through his body, head to toe. Then Raymond Darling fell sideways and unconscious to the floor, the floor of all the room of death's own life that filled with time and natural space. Chapter 2 Mum and Dad came running into the cellar where Raymond fell to be. Dad picked Raymond up. Dad was all arms to carry Raymond up and Mum was all around them with a feeling touch. Mum and Dad ran up together with Raymond in Dad's arms they ran together up the stairs, and Dad placed Raymond's body on the living room couch. Mum turned on the television set, and then she rubbed Raymond's forehead and his shoulders. Dad loosened Raymond's pants and shirt. He removed Raymond's socks, and he rubbed Raymond's feet. Then Dad slapped Raymond's face to waken him, and Raymond's eyes were suddened wide, to see the natural dying world of Mum and Dad. And Raymond felt them all around. He felt them all too close. 
He was too wide with fear, and his wideness pressed them back again, back away. Dad sat down in his easy chair. He lit a cigarette. Quickly, Dad smoked about half of the cigarette. Then, gradually, he became very distant. He seemed to be talking to himself silently. He gazed at an invisible point about heart high in front of his body, and his right hand with the cigarette moved in an irregular but repetitive pattern around the invisible point. He was shaping an ear in smoke. Mum brought out a magnificent dinner of roast beef and brown potatoes with natural gravy and creamed onions and niblets of canned corn. There was apple cider and also milk and hot rolls and a nice cake with hot cocoa and hot coffee too. Then immediately everyone went to bed. No one had eaten and no words at all. Chapter 3 One day Raymond went up into the attic. Dad kept a room there. Dad was in bed smoking. There were lots of papers scattered all around and many objects Dad had tried to sell over the years but which were now outdated. Raymond sat on the floor in front of the windows. There was bright sunlight coming in through the frames and the sunlight seemed to pour into the room in rectangular solid shapes marked out by the shape of the windows. There were millions of small particles in the air floating in the rect rectilinear volumes of the windowed sunlight. Raymond noticed that if he breathed and blew the air around the floor the particles would increase and fly about. Raymond breathed his blows of air and all the particles were blown to fly about in the geometric sunlight in front of Raymond's eyes. As he did this, Raymond felt he was looking at the basic form of reality and reality breathed itself into him by crashing down along the spire of inspiration into the deep of all his head to toe and living light invaded him like a choking mass of thumbs behind his tongue. Then Dad left the room and went downstairs, leaving the attic room to Raymond. And Raymond did as Raymond pleased himself to do, there in all the brightness of his attic room. Chapter 4 Raymond sat in his new attic room all day, every day and night. Sometimes Raymond saw the sunlight, shapes again, as before. But in time, the sun did not come so bright so very often. And so he became interested in the room itself. He cleaned the room and he put everything in order. He wondered what was really happening in the room and so he sat in it all the time and he looked at the room itself. Sometimes he would imagine the room to be filled with many different kinds of creatures. Sometimes he would merely feel everything as is, all animated by the great bright force of thumbs. Eventually he regathered all the scattered papers that he found there in the attic room and with a vagrant pencil also found he wrote a book by writing words on all the papers that he found. A little book about a ventriloquist and his dummy. Raymond named the little book The Ego and the God Idea. The Divine Lord played by the dummy was lying on his side on a thin mat under an airy window. He propped his forearm on his elbow and leaned his head in his hand. He was all heart and belly. His voice was intestinally deep and he never thought. Then the terrific cute creature came in, played by the ventriloquist. You had to love it immediately. 
It had big eyes and a round, bald head. He was a juicy little round one with a blue body, and his poor little teeth hung out in two great big ones in the centre of his upper lip, and there were only some little hairs in his ears. He was nude, like the Divine Lord, but all head and not much heart and belly, and his voice was a little peeping, twisting sound, like a small boy in his self-pity. Hello, Divine Lord. Hello, little one. Then the creature said, Believe it or not, I am the most poisonous creature in the whole world. I inject incredible, complete poisons with my big teeth. And I am also the only person in the universe except you. That is wonderful and miraculous power and being you are. And I am certainly happy to know you, said the Divine Lord. Thanks to you, my name is Meriden Smith, and I would like to tell you a lot. All right, said the Divine Lord, and he put his head down on the mat. It is a great thing how I am blue and round and poisonous, and you are the terrific Divine Lord, and I can kill you any time I like. I'll make some strokes and pineapples and move around wicked loops and possibles and some eating and special lightning roots of pinches hooled and reported in my cascade snacks and wheelers. How vegetable and pie are meaned and rapid, smoothing a groaned, patient place. Actual, actually, I'm weighted and save me, all right? Is visible and thank you very much for being me to life. Oh, wonderful, Meriden, said the Divine Lord. Since you ask to be saved, I will tell you this. The Divine Lord held up his great open right hand with his thumb and index finger just slightly apart, as if they held an important invisible object. Time is a vision of fragments, a collection of exclusives. Space is a vision of totality and inclusiveness. When you become concentrated in natural time, as in anxiety or in the arts of music and literature, abstraction and the reduction of something to parts and combinations kill both the inherent form and the inherent consciousness. But if you use such a concentration with intensity and thus infuse the incident with passion, then you raise the art into the inclusive mood of the one reality and even anxiety vanishes. Similarly, if you become concentrated in space as in the mood of natural pleasure or in the art of painting, then the single form that is becomes intelligence, even in the every moment's game of abstraction and the play of reduction. The compulsion to perceive space as it is, is always mediated by the obsession with time, and every moment of natural experience is always an experience of space-time, which is a mood both abstract or manifold and inclusive or radically single. The relationship between consciousness and form is a Mobius strip of sudden life. This is so. Therefore, all men and women are required to live with intensity, always magnifying the inherent assumption of consciousness itself, and also always directly confronting and transcending the specific specificity, uniqueness and complexity of this space-time moment. Thus the human business is not simply passion, nor mere awareness of everything, neither activity nor inertia, neither inclusion nor exclusion, but the real human business is perfect realisation of the only what that always already is. Except that when I walk around this place today, 
I see the countless men and women merely existing as compulsive and indolent fools. So be it, then, I guess, but always tell them to remember to accept a little dose of life's own plenty poison every day, always enough for health and never enough for death, until everyone is dead and done. Oh, ha, he, that's nature for ya. The Divine Lord could be terribly boring all the time, and the little blue one slowly rolled his eyes in the woozing ooze of divine doctrine. Even though he looked to all around, Meridian Smith had not noticed any men or women at all. But because there is only one, Meridian Smith bit the Divine Lord to death and was always very okay. Chapter 5 Then Raymond put his book on the floor, in the bright place where the sun comes. As he did it, he noticed that Dad had written a great play, for two principles and many voices, on the backs of all the sheets. Dad had named the play the Raymond and the Quandra. Raymond read it. Voices. The whole in the universe stands before the mind. Oranges in a napkin before you think of eye and thing. The shape of the room when eyes are closed. Raymond, darling, bright heart, stone and mirror of the real. Near of listening that falls to be living light above your head, the sphere of temperatures below, and only green to death is here. Round but forest green, no sky blue thing at all. Raymond darling, the one true water's only heart become the separate narcissus here. Quandra my bliss, the one true water's only brightness here become the seeming separate sound that merely echoes all the living light of you. And she is always sliding down between your eyes of brows. Her oh of pleasure draws you down is here. Your heels, your thighs, your feeling shoulders fall to hear the flowers speak your name. The eye and all of consciousness pours out a hollow blossom in your handmade ear. Now you will be with her, and she will be with you. She is here, and she is you. Her forehead rests in a cool air, here, clear blue eye of sky blue peace, shadow wasted in the forest round, delicious one of she born thighs arms of civil comfort that now to a pleasure in your neck. Her sound of pleasure, her pleasure is you, her bruised feet sliding in your heels and in the arches of your hands, her knees deep in your mind. All her sky-blue ease dissolves your pain of sense that weaves you to the green of woods. Your sides grow rigid, with enjoyment, while all your all of consciousness is falling, falling through the body's would-be wedding bed of nature's dying flowers within. Raymond, to me, yes, the shape of true water stands within the trees, with many empty houses in a yellow place that carry me down to deep and fly between each other like a churn of one great fish. My left and fallen knee is swollen on the threshold stairs of unfamiliarity, and there she is forever kissed and known by me. My head lay downward in the cellar beneath the barriers that bide true water, but I am awake to now.
to she is me. I see the dome of conscious light freestanding in my heart of heart. The shrine of brightness is my house, and she is there, and only he and she is I. Voices Your feeling heart must take her open like recessions of the sea, and she will trace your sunlit pain of body down in the sky-blue ointment of her moon-cool hands, and she will speak her love to you and call you wonderful. You are the one that sounds her anklet jewel in the sand. Her love will ring around the spire of a swan and swan with you, and she will wind your natural flowers through the open sea of true waters, only ocean. Quandra on the telephone. Raymond, I want to see you, baby. I'm all dressed, and the woman says I'm very pretty. I'm so excited. Voice. She is standing in the hall beside the true water. Raymond. Baby, I'm missing you already. Why don't we just have breakfast or something? Dad thinks I'm nuts. We've been drinking together all night and he can't even get his suit on. You're sure you want to marry me? Quandra. Don't you want me to? I want to, sweetheart. Voice. You hold the touch of vision deep behind the family ear. Dad is lying on the floor, putting on a tie. He holds a cigarette of prophecy and he moves his high right hand to shape your ear in smoke. He calls you inwardly to one true water's dome. You feel the distant voice of sheer part. Your voice of where is she is flattening the wedding silks. Your sorrow falls in spangles in the cloud of Dad, who calls your feeling heart to listen, while you fall to she. Raymond, I'm kidding, babe, but nerves. I've got tickets, rings, a cummerbund, planes, beaches, and a marriage. I'm not this kind of a guy. Wait until we get out of this place. I'm not even religious. Quandra. Oh, honey, can't you even be serious when we're getting married? Raymond. Who's not serious? I think I'm losing my brain. I love you, flower lady. Quandra. I love you, Mr. Darling. Voice. If you could see her face waiting for you, her thigh circled with the blue air so that her left knee is pulsing while the eternally invisible woman points her to the tabernacle to be wed. Raymond I promise you, baby, I promise we are the ones. Voices Quandra follows Darling up the threshold stairs. The stairs are green wood, painted green, Green over an old white wood without worm, but grey. The stairs are simple, indefinable, through the staircase spaces as they rise in time. She sees the natural city lights below. At first there are no rooms, a dark hall for waiting. Your heels are sensitive, your neck is soiled, her thumbs will pierce your hips. There is a memory of the sea and of literature, costumes, beds, beside a pool of bright true water, knees, tables. In the sea, the sounding animals go deep to find true water's source. On the beach, the waiting animals go mad from salad days of death's own time. Liftless airs take death in hand within the cave of fire, where all the loveless strangers take the one-shot bride, open full to wide.
resistant as a willow tree, while the blind Narcissus listens to a boat at sea. Raymond, she is not here and never will be again. I took her only once, in our cave of once together by the always inland sea. Everything was glistened, bright, and we that moment seemed to slip down, easy, like a mountain in a wedding bed of perfumed oils. And she was so happy, and I kissed her a lot while we sat for our few hours by true water's edge of life and death, and I loved her. When I saw her in that would-be wedding place, I sobbed. She was so beautiful, and she was so willingly mine. But there I was, in the fallen dark, beside the willowed swan, watching her, thinking how she would love me in the coming days of sun all day, and how she would only wonder all over me how much she loved me. And believe me, I cried, I cried all night in the afterfall of fall in love. How could I dare to possess her? How could I dare to love her equally? Perhaps we would grow old and, by a natural weary progress, care less and less about the death of love's found life. But it is always possible to lose any day. Voice Quandra, whose casket is white, with a deep pattern in velvet, cut with paisley shapes, like the wallpaper in your parents' bedroom. Raymond, in the cabinet, sees the psychic loved one in her time, invertebrate and empty, like a ribbon and a gourd. He did not want to see her as she is, with nature's angry still life in her throat. The fruits he cannot eat are broken from her flesh to feed the mind. Her iconic sleeping feet are cut open at the bottoms with small indifferent flowers. And she is, by a meaningless intention, made to mean in mind what only my body dares to speak. Raymond There was a cave of fire in the widow's wedding room, and there were many other men with me. They were the dogs of other that run wild to kill the flying horse of one time's love of bodied light. We watched her all together, there on love night's beach of day. We watched her in the wedding room of mum and dad, and all the other men desired her as much as I. I was the only one who loved her there, but I was deaf afraid to take her to my house. And so I left her there to all the other men. I flew to sky blue sky of height and fell again and broke my feeling heart on fallen ground until she falls on me. Voices on the beach of true water, the boats of possibility can all be counted as in a looking glass, with the only whale and one great bird, and the torches of the feeling heart are quenched in loveless undersea, and the whitest horse of dawn runs round the ocean edges on the cliffs, while the killing dogs run the darkest horse of day into a cave to drown your creature there. All night you wait, lying in the fire. Your roasted hand hangs open across your eye. Quandra hands you a new cut flower in your mind. Your mind is all the flower that remains of her. This flower is the last hallucination. Then the boats and the salad to remember her.
Chapter 6 Raymond put the dad play down on the floor. Dad's play of Raymond Darling and his quandra made Raymond feel sad, but after all, Dad was a Raymond Darling too. Raymond's own book of how the ego creates and destroys the objective idea of divine being had only made him feel peculiar, but after all, the feeling heart is not a merely poisoned thing, except it must refuse to make an other from all the thing and what that is mere one. And that mere one may yet also bite the ego's birthing egg of self-made shape and drop the little creature down into the shape of shape itself. The sun was pouring sun bright in, rectangular and solid on the floor again, but Raymond was not interested in the sunlight shapes any more. He knew that Mum and Dad were downstairs. He knew that everything was merely and simply existing. There was for now no deep, no higher, no other, no distance, no past, no future, no serious suffering. Then Raymond forgot it all, and he wondered how to fill his room. He put himself on the floor and enjoyed the ceiling. The ceiling was made of many angles and planes, like a complex vault. It would make an interesting floor, he thinks, so many forms to lean against, the wonderful chairs and slides to lie in, hanging over the windows, the little lamps of daylight growing in the floor, the climate closets, the point of view is lying on the floor and looking down at the sun. There seemed to be a mystery behind the walls, behind the naked angularity of multi-planes, behind the room itself. Is that true water's sound, running in straight lines behind the family walls? It is the mystery of true water's living light that makes a sphere of my perception. My right hand under the water's radiator here, and it is cold. The rough edges of the radiator where the casting mould clenched the molten radiator on the day of its invention in space-time. And all the upright panels of the me surrounding walls rotated at the beginning by an unknown carpenter. The out-of-nowhere frames of all the windows and the point of eaves that flies above me makes a would-be highest height that sits me like a family bird within a tree of furniture. A mystery conceals the room, the captive room that hides the mystery of me with things and walls. He lay on his back and mounted himself backwards on his hands and feet, and he looked upwards at the floor, and he looked downwards from the ceiling. And Raymond looked at the room. He thought, there is no consciousness in the room. And he thought, how to put it there? Chapter 7 Then Raymond waited quietly until it grew very late and dark. When it was dark, he crawled slowly and silently downstairs. He was nude so that his clothing would not brush against things and wake mum and dad. Raymond crawled until he found a room beside a dark hall. The door, the door was closed except for a small space. He could hear dad strike a match and slowly exhale his smoke. Mum's feet showed at the end of the bed. She softly rubbed her arches over the knuckles and nails of her toes. Dad spoke. You have not seen it unless you have seen your loved one there, as silent as the male, and you exiled to waiting for your heart of heart to come in ships and slide along the beach. Then Mum raised her voice into a little peeping, twisting sound, as if to echo imitate a small boy 
in his self-pity. I'm folded in my clothing on the weed. My fish is eaten, humbled me. My speech is rotted on the spirest salt. Who swooned this kneeling sun? The underworld seed of numberless grey raiments here below. The sun of he, like sun itself, of earth's own space of sky that shined so bright to all the moon of countless she. And so I ask, who fell him down to here? Now forever fallen onto living water's beach of exiled light, and only sees his image soar with death, reflected on the top of sea. And I, too wounded to uncapture my relief, the starry creature's mouth pour me, I fall to death's encrusted sleep of sire without an heir. The heart of hearts is nevermore the me of me to be. Then she laughed, oh ha he, expecting dad to laugh, but Raymond could hear dad slashing his feet back and forth under the covers, hitting mum in the shins and pushing her out of bed. Then it was quiet, except that Raymond could hear mum snuckling her nose in quiet crying. Then she asked very solemnly, What are you now? Dad made some short breathing laughs in his nose, as if very satisfied to recognise himself perfectly. Then he said, The pastimes of Narcissus. Who is he? He is getting to cry, which is the shape of a seahorse. And how will he survive? He cannot survive. His business is death. Narcissus eyes the true heart all the time. The way a blind man listens to a distant boat passing by on all the possibility of all reflecting water. And everything is a mere reflection here, reflected in the mirror of the water's shine. And I know the water is the one true heart. I know the one true heart is all the all-reflecting water here. I know Narcissus does not know this what, that is, the every single thing his eye, his eye and ear define. The only water does not interest him. The mind of things is all the only all he thinks to think or know. And if the what is never known, not even anything is known in truth at all. Then they were quiet, and Raymond could hear them turning in opposite directions in order to sleep. Chapter 8 Raymond crawled very quietly away toward the kitchen. When he was in the middle of the kitchen floor, under the table, the light suddenly went on. Raymond looked up and saw Mum through the glass tabletop. She seemed not to notice him, but went about preparing a meal. Mum put a beautiful roasted turkey on the table, with delicious stuffing, cranberry sauce and candied carrots, asparagus tips and artichokes with butter, peas, baked yams, tomato juice, chocolate milk and ice cream. Then she turned out the light and returned to her room. Raymond crawled out and sat at the table in the dark. There was a slight radiance from the moon and he was able to see the forms of food. So he ate very nicely and everything was very good. He had some breast meat in gravy and then reached for a drumstick, but there was no drumstick. He reached to the other side of the turkey, but there was none there either. He became very still and terrified, and in the silence he could hear someone chewing. In the slightness of the moon, he could see someone's shape across from him. Then a match was struck, and Raymond could see Dad lighting a cigarette. 
On a plate in front of Dad were the two drumsticks, chewed to the bone. Raymond was not sure if Dad had noticed him. He was not sure whose meal this was supposed to be. He sat in the silence while Dad smoked his cigarette. Raymond was silent and he was scared afraid, but soon he stopped being scared and he started to get a little hysterical. He felt he was going to laugh out loud and he clamped his lips, but then he started snorting and he had to laugh out loud. He laughed and laughed and then he realised that Dad was laughing too. And they laughed and laughed until tears ran out of their eyes. And they were rubbing their eyes and laughing and blowing their noses in the napkins. Chapter 9 Then it was quiet again. Dad stood up and walked out the door into the yard. Raymond followed. Dad unrolled the garden hose and he walked the nozzle out along the edge, along the edging of the lawn. Raymond turned on the water and he walked over next to Dad. Dad turned the nozzle so there was a fine spray of water and then a heavier one, so that the water spurted in a single stream made of hundreds of small sprays and they stood while Dad watered the lawn and the shrubs and the trees, heavy with spring blossoms and the garden flowers and more of the lawn. Then Dad opened the front of his pyjamas and he grasped his cock in his right hand and he spit and he pissed on the lawn. Raymond, remembering he was already nude, grasped his own cock in his own right hand and he pissed on the lawn too. Dad spit again and several times while he pissed and Raymond spit. Raymond felt very happy pissing and spitting on the lawn with Dad. Then the front door opened and they could see Mum just slightly as she walked out onto the lawn. Mum stopped and stood in the clear centre of the yard where the moonlight made a full moon glow in the middle of the family garden and Mum began to run around in all the garden yard and Raymond could see that Mum was wearing no clothes at all. Mum ran and jumped and yelled. She made a spire above her head with her arms and she jumped up toward her hands and she made a ball of her body by raising her knees and she ran in a circle all around the yard of moon. And Mum scattered her arms and legs in the forms of ecstatic dance. And Raymond and Dad began to laugh together again, because they both thought Mum did not think they were there. And then Mum heard their laughing laughs, and so she danced no more of dance. And Mum went back inside the family house without a word. But Raymond ran on out and danced him under the ecstatic moon of trees. And Dad sprayed Raymond with the garden hose and all the household family water. And Raymond danced around and around on all his toes in the very centre of the family yard until he fell in a dizzy swoon. And Raymond felt the earth all twisting around, beneath him, all around. Then Raymond lay there on the moving ground, and Raymond rested, and the water stopped, and Raymond swooned a while, and all the all was swooning all around. And after the swooning, swooning, while Raymond got up, and he walked quietly into the house, where Mum and Dad were asleep. And Raymond crawled upstairs, trying not to awaken Mum and Dad because he felt the swoon. He swooned, was more of light than they had told him he should ever see.
Chapter 10 In the morning Raymond was still asleep. The sun filled the room. There were no shadows at all. Raymond felt a hand grasp his shoulder softly and Raymond opened his eyes. Dad was there and he looked directly into Raymond's face. Dad's face seemed wide and full of colour and bright. There were deep lines curving upward in the expression of his eyes and his eyes and all his features seemed moist and vigorous with, with sadly feeling love. Raymond got up and dressed quietly while Dad sat in a chair and smoked. When Dad saw that Raymond was ready, Dad stood up and Raymond followed Dad to the car. They drove into the city. Raymond had seen the city before on television. Everywhere there were people, walking animals and riding bikes. The sky was in the grey winds. They came to the head of a street that turned into a tunnel. Above them, Raymond could hear the slamming of a train. All the buildings were built one into another and rose up above the edges of the railway. Dad parked the car and they walked into a narrow building. The hall was dark except for a small neon sign that flashed with an arrow pointing upstairs to a barber shop. Raymond followed Dad up the stairs. At the top there was a large room with a black and white linoleum floor laid out like a checkerboard and huge mirrors covering the two opposite long walls. There were porcelain chairs in two long rows and shelves of bottles with coloured tonics, combs and jars of metal parts. The metal walls and the ceiling were an eggshell colour of white, pressed with a fleur de lis, and the walls were surrounded with nude calendars, and the all reflected mirrors multiplying all the all that was around. There were fifteen barbers in short white coats, and four petrified women in crisp pastel dresses, and with their hair all glued up in fancy arrangements. There was no one else except a strange-looking large man in a checked flannelled shirt and baggy work pants. The strange large man looked like a 50-year-old boy. His face had a swollen look and the texture of a washed potato. The old boy had a little box in hand. It was for shining shoes. Raymond sat down in front of the old boy. The old boy put the little box down and Raymond put his right foot shoe on the little box. The old boy grinned, a goony grin, at Raymond and the old boy said, I'm nuts. Then the old boy punched Raymond in the left knee and laughed. There was an unconscious hum, a sort of clicking sound in the old boy's chest, and Raymond loved him. Dad sat down in the porcelain chair, and one of the barbers put a large white sheet with narrow black, black stripes all over Dad, covering Dad from his chin to below his knees. The barber embraced Dad's shoulders warmly, like an old friend. He seemed to have tears in his eyes and he took Dad's right hand in both his hands and looked warmly into Dad's eyes. Raymond, darling, you have come after all these years. I haven't seen you since the war. You are straight and tall and strong as a young man, like we were in the trenches. And, I see, you have brought your young son. What will it be? The regular, Dad said, and a nice shave, and be sure and take care of my young son. I certainly will, Mr. Darling. The barber came over to the old boy, who was shining Raymond's right foot shoe, and the barber grasped the old boy's working elbow. The old boy looked up at the barber, who looked him fully in the face with great love 
and understanding. The old boy looked at Raymond and grinned and nodded. Yes, as if Raymond should know this was really going to be done right. Then the barber signalled the four women who with his suddenly raised right hand. And each of the women came in a wiggly hurry and each woman kissed Raymond on the forehead and the cheek. But only one of them kissed him on the hands and she rolled a metal table up to Raymond and a rolling stool and she began to rub his left hand with lotion and with small knives she shaped his left hand nails with strong square ends as if to disguise the small roundness of his fingertips. Raymond was enjoying the soft pleasure the old boy gave to his right foot with the brushes and the rags. Even the small injuries on his left hand fingers gave him a natural pleasure and a feeling of strength. Then Raymond saw the barber put a towel of steam onto Dad's face and then the barber leaned Dad's chair way down and back and so Raymond could see only could only see Dad laid out and down and covered strangely in a shroud. And Raymond looked out hard at the petrified woman and the old boy, hard at work to please him. And Raymond felt a great heat in his chest and then he knew he was crying. Raymond spoke to the old boy and the woman. I know this place and I am not afraid. This is the end of me and Dad, but I have already been dead for at least six months. The old boy laughed and said, Me too. The woman told Raymond not to cry about it and said, Try and be very calm. I think everyone has noticed you are crying. Raymond went on, smiling, obviously as he spoke. They didn't realise it, but I died. I am standing in the first room and it is cold and I wallop my left knee hard as I can, smack and I knocked unconsciousness, unconscious to be born and yelling, oh, and wheezing, oh, and mum and dad are running in the snow to find me in the open yard. But Mer Meridian Smith finds me in the cellar where I fall, and he shows me I am dead. Then mum and dad come running down to the cellar where I am born to die. But dad stops for a moment to dig a tub of pure virgin snow on the lawn, and mum whips up a fine snow pudding and she sings to me while I eat. Raymond quickly looked across to the mirror in front of dad and Raymond saw his own images in thousands, counting back to infinity with Dad. The barber grinned at Raymond, and the barber casually strop, stropped a blade on leather. Or was it stroked a blade on leather? And the barber turned the sound up on the radio. The unconscious hum was wheeling in the old boy's chest. The old boy stood and dragged his little box to Raymond's left foot shoe. The woman took Raymond's right hand and she briskly rubbed it and she quickly shaped his right hand nails and she hurt his right hand fingers with the injuries of manicure. And the old boy began to hurt Raymond's left foot with the hard rubber brushes and quick rags. Dad began to speak softly to the barber through the steaming towel. The surfaces are always rich and public. The coffin, I remember, was white, with a raised flowery design, like wallpaper impressed with velvet. The corpse of the young woman is not made visible in the tabernacle where her event was made. She was all corpse. The swollen pumpkin face of the all dead one, the long moment, the stare I gave to her to recognise her face. I cannot identify her at all. I missed the death entirely. It happened 
while I was on vacation at the lake. The barber stood behind Dad and caressed Dad's shoulders. He looked into Dad's reflections in the mirrors, and his own reflections too. The thousands of eyes of Dad and the barber fixed in each other one by one. And Raymond saw the countless images, images of seeming omnipresent dad and the omnidirectional barber too. And Raymond saw himself in countless numbers too, all over and everywhere with them. And all the smithereens of shape, the cubist planes of mirrors, the abstract walls within the opened floors, the expressive toweling, and all the dry symbolic garments obliquely passing through the formal airs and all the clockwork combs and the blast of hairs. Chapter 11 In time the barber caught the line of Raymond's eye and the barber winked a thousand winks but Raymond safely looked away, and as Raymond's countless eyes cast his red embarrassment off the all-observing mirrors, Raymond missed the sudden shift of all the necks. The quick, tongue-swallowing throats of all the fourteen other barbers, and the pouting looks of pretty pity on all the faces of the three leftover women, shattered to a turn toward Dad. The countlessly mirrored barber massaged and pulled Dad's open face in the hugely multiplied hot towel, and the barber at infinity up-pulled Dad's countless eyes and ears with a sudden roughhouse touch. First, a nice clean shave, and then I'll make you a Roman helmet from this lion mane you've grown. Look at these shapes. Then the barber slipped the towel from Dad's eyes and with a mean tough shove he twisted Dad's head toward the checkerboard floor. Dad could see the broken scattering of all the previous hairs, the stars and wheels of vanity, the brief wads of self-made curls, the locks and ends above the brow, the small burn sides with many coloured kinks and spurs. Of course, the few thick wires of noses, and the whirly brows themselves, and the tiny unwanted charm and flow of natural and handmade beards, and all the slicked off suds of sprucings trim and cut and baby facing, and the checkerboard itself that celebrates the play of opposites, the twists, the wood go around. Then the barber roughly lifted Dad's head up and pressed him back into the setback chair. And with a sudden snap, the nasty barber whipped and sharply drew the steaming hot towel through the complicated air. And the hot towel cracked a thousand times aloud within itself. And the barber began to shout aloud about himself. The hairs that fall from these chairs fall in chequered patterns where I will. You could frame them since you last saw me. I've become an artist. I'm expensive as hell. The angry barber was yelling now into Dad's face. Then all the other fourteen barbers ran to Dad and they held him firmly to the chair by his every body part and the angry barber made more shouts and stropped his blade a final time. And all the three leftover women ran to Dad too with all their knives. And all the four women kissed Dad deeply on the mouth and they rubbed his legs and knees like Mum might do, but with their knives in hand. And in a blood of instant breath, Raymond could see small stains of Dad. And all... <coughs> And all of Dad came flying out. And Dad was no one in the shroud. And Dad was wide within a family death. Chapter 12 
And Raymond looked around and up. And Raymond heard a shouting shape of Dad. And Raymond saw a helpless Dad fall down from off the household roof. The shots that cut right through the neighbourhood were making steel-hard rings. The long-expected flash and gunning of the democratic neighbour wars began. The mum and dad battalions of every cult of pairs poured out into the neighbourhood of street and two by two the married friends were bombing everywhere from house to house. The billions of the nations of the every ego's claim were knifing one another tusk to tusk and every man was man to man and every woman did her part and every household's weapons were amazing on the street and every single body was cut down to his own size of mind and every individual declared a separate state. The indivisible was first to crack the single all-surrounding mirror of the inner lighted world was shaped to lightless inner death, conformed to countless images of unrelated things. The day Narcissus fell into the self-reflecting pond of mind and the echo of his eager eye was howled into the thinking street. And all the whitest swan of unity that was inspired to settle down in Raymond's attic room, became a flying bird of misery, an infinite supply of broken world, an orderly supply of separated parts in alphabetic columns, two by two. And all of mankind, one by one, became a mob of mummery, a clacking pattern of mere and clicking individuals with murderously reasonable demands and something threw the dice of space and time into the late time space, and all the natural forces said, now it is time to cave the world of human foreheads into fast asleep and wallop all their wallopers into the slamming sea that never sees them all apart. And darkest epoch killed the light, and that, as it was said, was that. And Raymond saw Dad fall from Mum. Dad fell into the garden from a seeming highest height. The shroud that Barbara covered Dad was cut to a white as ash, and Dad's cut flower oozed with heartfelt reddish liver oil, and Dad slipped out unloved from Mum's most fatal dance. Mum vanished like a tiny sound through noises on the roof and her event was flown away. And Dad fell body down into the moonless yard. And Dad's cold fleshes broke like sausage casings on the butcher pe papered checkerboard of his never celebrated life. And all Dad's inmost grizzle, gristle burst from all his soup bone joints. And Raymond saw Dad fall into the abattoir of natural things where every man goes in as someone and comes out as checkered everything. But Raymond's heels were fastened to the old boy's little box and this is not your war and death was spit shined onto both his shoes and his right arm was hammer-locked and clove-hitched to his brilliant spine, and all his fingertips were bleeding for the love of humankind, and all his sores of sympathy were sparkling bright with all the heat of broken heart for broken man that blasted through his hopeless knot of arms. And Raymond's belly churned and soured, with myth of matter's curdled milk of light, and late times culture sickness filled him with a desperate urge to flight, and he was ear to ear aloft into the sour fumes of mankind's mortal fright, with end times vomit in his collars, from all the broken up exploded forms of man.
that fell beneath his feet. The all of nature's voices burst the gun of earth's last look at living light, and all of life went cold in fractured multi-planes of solid noise and narrow freezing edges of uncalculated screams. And the goons of nowhere's nothing came on down the childhood street of everyone. And Mum and Dad was scattered infinitely all around to everywhere where Raymond could not go to see. And all he thought he knew was thunder cracked to ignorance of what there is. And all the hidden lightnings in the wall groaned out. And all the neighbourhood was dead. And all of television's anti-culture stained the lung of Raymond's worldwide breath. And matter world's unconscious science poisoned both his hands, and awful blood of human hurry raced him out and curled him through the wasted great tradition of his neighbourhood. And everything of humankind all showed itself to be a nonsense of the senseless wars of mind. And Raymond saw the nothingness behind the family walls, and Raymond fell from childhood's heaven down the stairs of mankind's boat. And Raymond fell from home's old house. He fell until he stood again. Until he stood, he fell, he fell new fallen on his left hand knee and cried to out for truth and light within the former family yard.